Hi, my name is Jeffrey Ralph Zorn, and I'm presenting a paper today called Been There, Done That, Storage Pits at Tel Nazbe and the Role of the State. Almost 80 years after the completion of the excavations at the site, Tel Nazbe continues to provide important data on many aspects of ancient Israelite society. At the 2011 ASOR annual meeting in San Francisco, Aaron Brody and I organized a session devoted specifically to new studies related to this site, and these studies have now been published. In addition, through the generous financial support of the Bade Museum of Biblical Archaeology in Berkeley, California, the original Tel uh, Nas Bay site report from 1947 is now available online at both the Bade Museum site and at my personal research site. Also available is Bade's original site manual. Both of these publications have been out of print for many years and they're now completely and freely available. Over the years, I've put a little thought into sorting out uh, various problems and aspects of the archaeology and stratigraphy of Tel Nasbe. Some of what I wrote in my dissertation 20 years ago and in subsequent publications has made it out into the scholarly community. However, some things that I wrote about back then are still little known, and so today I want to speak about one of these uh, lesser known topics, the site's underground storage pits, and then provide some reasons for why I believe these pits are best understood as aspects of the state-sponsored uh, uh, initiative at the site. A unique aspect of the architectural and archaeological remains from Tel Anazbe is the presence of a series of 61 stone-lined storage pits sunk into the dirt fill. These were called bins in the 1947 report in order to differentiate them from similar rock-cut installations that were sunk down into the limestone and which were called silos. So bins were in the dirt and silos were in the bedrock. These 61 pits loop around the southern part of the site. They extend from just south of the inner four chamber gate to about the middle of the western side of the settlement. Here, just drink to slide. Here is the area of the inner gate, the southeastern side of the site, the southern end of the site, and two views at the southwestern side of the site. And on the last two slides, you'll notice that there is uh, an image in red that is overlaid over the uh, black walls. The image in red is actually uh, text figure 42 from the site report. It does not appear, these remains do not appear on the 1 to 400 scale plan of the site that was published with it, nor in the 1 to 100 scale plans that were not published and that are in the Bade Museum. They're only in this text figure, but if you overlap the text figure with the 1 to 100 plans, you can see that there are several uh, silos or several uh, storage pits there that do not appear on the other plans. So we have to include that uh, illustration here. The pits are located in the intramural area between the settlement's original defenses, a casemate-like wall formed by the broad back rooms of houses arranged around the periphery of the site, and the massive inset offset wall. This original town is known as Stratum 3C, the addition of the fortifications is 3B, and the subsequent modifications to the town are known as 3A in the revised stratigraphy of the site. Many sites in Iron Age Israel spanning the length of the country and beginning in the Iron Age 1 and continuing through Iron Age 2 and beyond uh, have pits of various kinds. Some of the best known examples are from the Iron 1 period, in sites such as uh, Tel Dan, Stratum 6, Hatzor, Stratum 12, Itzbet Sarta, Stratum 2, and Tel Beit Meretzim, Stratum B. In these sites, the pits typically cluster around uh, houses or in pit fields of the unwalled settlement. They are not found in a separate and distinct enclosed zone such as at Tel Nazbe. This suggests that the construction of the Tel Nazbe pits is a separate phenomenon from these other more ad hoc instances. The intramural zone mentioned earlier is another unique aspect of the site. This space and the pits in it were created after the construction of the massive inset offset wall. The area between the original casemate-like wall and the inset offset wall sloped steeply. Large amounts of debris were poured into this area to create a level surface. The storage pits were constructed in this fill. Now, of course, they could have been constructed at any time after the fill was deposited. 
However, there is evidence that suggests that the pits were part of the overall fortification construction project and not just an afterthought. The evidence for this relationship between the fortifications and the pits is found in the relationship of the pits and the fortifications to the town's drainage system. Along the northern and western side of the site, a series of seven drains were constructed in the same intramural fill as the pits. An eighth drain directed water out of the town through the inner and outer gate system on the east. Telanaz Bay slopes downward from south to north. Water that flowed along the settlement's roads and alleys was channeled north and west into the intramural area and then through the inset offset wall through these drains. The drains and pits overlap in only a small area along the southwestern part of the site. That's the green area in the slide. This suggests that the pits and drains were constructed with a joint purpose in mind. The pits were constructed to store food and the drains coupled with the slope of the town's alleys and surfaces function to direct the water away from the subsurface storage pits at the southern end of the site. Clearly, keeping the southern intramural area as dry as possible was a major concern. Because the drains led through the town wall, they were constructed at the same time. And since the drains served to protect the pits, the pits should also belong to the same overall construction stage. Now it's time to look more closely at the pits themselves. The storage pits are not evenly distributed. They occur in clusters, singly, or in lines, sometimes with linking walls. 61 is probably a minimal estimate for the number of intramural pits. It is possible that some pits were destroyed by subsequent construction in the intramural area. The average surface area of the 61 Telenaz Bay pits was about 1.4 square meters. The depths for only two of the pits were recorded, however. Bin 388, to use the uh, site report terminology, had a depth of about 2 meters, and Bin 386 was 1.7 meters deep. The excavators likely only uncovered the top courses of some of the remaining pits. Also, the pits found at the southernmost end of the site were excavated in the first two seasons of excavation when recording methods were more rudimentary. It is possible that upper courses of pit walls were lost over time, and so the pits may have originally been somewhat deeper. However, the two available pit depths likely provide minimal depths for the remaining Telenaz Bay pits and this would give us an average capacity for the pits of between 2.3 and 2.8 cubic meters, which in turn provides a total storage capacity of between 143 and 168 cubic meters, which is about 143 to 168,000 liters of wheat, or around 110 to 129,000 kilos of wheat, which is in round numbers about 120 tons. At 200 kilograms per year, this is enough grain for between 550 and 645 people. An alternative es estimate can be based on amounts derived from Mesopotamian ration lists. These suggest 60 liters of barley per month for a man, 30 for a woman, and 20 to 15 for children and the aged. Assuming around 25 liters of wheat per month, which would be about 300 liters per year per person in Israel, suggests that between 480 and 560 people could be supplied from these pits. The precise number, however, is not crucial. The amount of grain that could likely be stored in these pits could feed over half of the estimated 900 inhabitants of the town, before losses to spoilage, pests, or the need to reserve grain for seed or for sieges or the like are factored in. Assuming that around 15% would have been lost to pests and spoilage and another 15% reserved for other purposes means that the uh, pits could have provided food for about 350 people. And of course, there's no guarantee that these pits were always or ever filled to maximum capacity, but these figures do indicate that a substantial number of people could have been fed from the pits. Clearly, the intramural pits contributed a substantial storage capability to the settlement's previous storage capacity. The question then is, who owned the pits and their contents? Were they property of individual homeowners, nuclear families, extended families? Were they the property of some super family, family level uh, organization? The town itself? The state? Who knows? Assuming that the pits were owned by families, nuclear or extended, 
raises an important issue that must be taken into account regarding the settlement storage capacity prior to the construction of the pits. That is, the same number of houses, about 200, existed at the site before the walls were constructed as after. If there was adequate storage capacity for people before the pits were constructed, why were the pits needed? For example, the bedrock and the northern and southern parts of the site were dotted with the rock-cut silos, about 201 total, and they're best represented, as I said, in the northern and southern parts of the site. Now, it's difficult to date when most of these rock-cut silos were cut and when they went out of use, but since they were cut into bedrock, they were all most likely hewn during the Iron Age Stratum, one, uh, stratum 4. Often these silos are found in dense concentrations and many were cut across by walls of stratum 3 houses. Still, not all of them were, and since they were pre-existing storage facilities, some percentage of them likely continued in use in stratum 3. The average capacity of the rock cut silos was 2.4 cubic meters, oddly close to the capacity of the, silo, of the uh, pits, yielding an estimated total capacity for the 115 measurable silos as 272 cubic meters. If the remaining silos had similar capacities, the total volume was about 482 cubic meters. This is about 381,000 kilos, or 381 tons of grain. Before accounting for spoilage or losses to pests or the need to reserve grain for other purposes, this is enough for 1,900 people. Even reducing this amount by 30% to account for these losses is enough food for 1,300 people. And even if only a fraction of these rock-cut silos continued into use into stratum 3, they provided substantial storage capacity. Of course, homeowners in stratum 3C before the fortifications and pits were constructed could store food in jars, sacks, baskets, hanging from places, on shelves, or even heaped on the floor of their homes. If there was adequate household storage capacity before the pits were constructed, then why were they dug? Perhaps then the evidence tilts towards the theory that these pits were part of governmental storage facilities at Tel Anazbe. However, here too there are issues which must be addressed. The first issue involves the nature of governmental storage facilities. Facilities connected with governmental storage activities take a number of forms in Iron Age Israel and have been found at a variety of sites. Perhaps the most impressive is the well-known Stratum III silo from Megiddo, which has a diameter of 11 meters and a depth of 7 meters with a reported capacity of 450 cubic meters or about three times the capacity of all of the, si of the pits at Tel Anazbe combined. Less well-known but also impressive is the silo from Iron II Beth Shemesh which averages about 7 meters in diameter and was at least 4 meters deep with a capacity of 155 cubic meters or about the same capacity as all the pits at Tel Anazbe combined. Buildings with long halls, such as the Citadel at Hatzor and the so-called Governor's Residency at Beersheba are often thought to have served as storage magazines. Finally, some have argued that the famous tripartite pillar buildings, also often called stables, could have served for storage purposes. Common to all these facilities are that they are located well within their respective sites and were of quite substantial construction. The pits found at Tel Anazbe are located around the periphery of the site and are, dare I say it, pitiful by comparison. Can they truly represent an attempt by the government to create storage facilities at Tel Anazbe? To answer this question, another question must be answered first. If the government had wanted to build substantial storage capacity at Tel Anazbe, why did it not construct storehouses or massive silos such as there were at the sites that I just mentioned? And the answer to this is multifaceted. The first part of the answer is tied to the overall agenda surrounding the adaptation of a crudely defended rural agricultural town into a strongly fortified border fortress. The engineers who saw to the construction of the massive inner and outer gate complex and the inset offset wall purposefully sighted these defenses downslope from the original town. They clearly wished to avoid sighting these monumental walls where they would damage or destroy any part of the dwellings of the existing settlement. In fact, the residential character of the site in Stratum 3, consisting primarily of three and four room houses, persisted all the way to the beginning of, of the sixth century. There are no monumental structures to be found anywhere within the original limits of the town. 
It seems then that the same agenda which prevented the engineers from encroaching on the original town as they constructed its new defenses precluded any new constructions there at all. If government storage facilities were to be constructed, they would have to be beyond the original town. The only available open space then was the intramural area. Now, the narrow limits of this space, typically 5 to 10 meters, precluded the construction of massive storage facilities, buildings, silos, what have you. But the space was perfect for the age-old stone-lined storage pit. While the other, more massive constructions would likely have suited the ideological display purposes of the government better, it was apparently considered more important to avoid discomfiting the town's inhabitants through the seizure and destruction of their homes. Perhaps it was thought imperative to maintain the goodwill of the Benjaminite inhabitants of the town situated as it was on a periodically volatile border. Finally, as noted earlier, the town wall and accompanying drains were constructed at the same time and were certainly a product of a state-sponsored initiative. The drains created by the government served to help protect the pits. While it's possible that the government could have invested so many resources to create new storage capacity simply for the town's inhabitants, it seems more likely that they were created to serve the needs of the state. After all, the real estate created in the intramural zone was new land created by the state. Remember, before it was the steeply sloping area that couldn't be used. The grain stored in these pits could have been used for many purposes such as local trade, to supply any troops uh, garrisoned at this border town as a reserve in case of a siege, or to pay for governmental expenditures of various sorts. It's clear from the above that the intramural storage pits are not part of the widespread use of pits in the Iron I period. The rock-cut silos found so abundantly at the northern and southern ends of the site are the Tel and Nazbe analogs to this phenomenon. Rather, the 3B fortifications, drains, and storage pits can thus be considered a government initiative at Tel Anazbe belonging to the Iron II period. But when in this lengthy time span does this project then belong? Until recently, the gate and wall system were attributed to King Asa of Judah at the beginning of the 9th century on the basis of 1 Kings 1522, which credits construction work at Mitzpah, which is usually identified with Tel Anazbe, to King Asa. Recently, however, Professor Israel Finkelstein has attempted to downdate the Tel Anazbe defenses to a later period, the time of Joash of Judah, closer to 800 BCE because his theories of Israelite and Judean state formation require that state formation in Judah follow that in Israel. If there was no real state in northern Israel much before the middle of the 9th century, then there can be no state in Judah before that. If there was no state in Judah, then there was no one in the early 9th century to build the walls of Tel Anazbe, and then the storage pits. It should be noted, however, that there are no biblical traditions that credit Joash with construction at Mitzpah. Therefore, Professor Finkelstein must posit that the biblical authors relying on dodgy traditions misassigned the construction project of Joash to Asa. Unfortunately, archaeological data to decide the issue is not available. The fills adjacent to the walls were not excavated by modern stratigraphic standards, and any pottery from a recorded cut through the wall was neither published nor recorded, so the issue must remain undecided. The final period of the use of the pits is a bit clearer. While some pits may have gone out of use already during the lifespan of Stratum III, which again is about 300 years, where local stratigraphy is clear, it's, it seems that the pits were cut or covered by remains of Stratum II of the Babylonian to Persian period. Thus, the pits seem to have lasted in use as a phenomenon to the end of the Kingdom of Judah. In conclusion, no matter which chronological scheme is used, the fortifications, drains, and pits were most likely constructed during the 9th century. The pits are distinct from the fields of rock-cut silos, which are the best analogs to the Iron I period at Tel Anaz Bay and at other sites. The pits provide an interesting example of how the needs of a state can be met with a very basic and simple technology, and attest to the adaptive thinking of the officials charged with turning Mitzpah from a rural agricultural town into a fortress on what was often a problematic border. The concerns of the inhabitants were met by not encroaching on their homes, while, the, while still providing for the defensive and storage needs of the states. Thank you.